And as always, I just want to start by introducing the Community Engagement Forum, which is an online community of practice on community engagement in displacement responses. Um, we are part of the CCCM cluster, um, uh -huh. but open to any cluster or sector um, uh, displacement practitioner. Also, if you're not currently working for a cluster or a sector, everyone's welcome to join us. Um, uh, we share a lot of resources on engaging um, the affected population in displacement responses. Um, and behind me here, you can see you can actually scan this uh, QR code and you'll come to um, a landing page mm -hmm. where you can access all of our online platforms and join the ones that suit you the best for access to all the resources that we're sharing. And one of the ways that we share resources and experiences and challenges and, and tips is these uh, um, community coffee and chats every month. And uh, today we'll be talking about um, site closure and transition and how we can engage the community in the best way um, to um, for, for safe closure and, and um, uh, how we can do this in a responsible manner. Um, so I won't be saying much more about that. I will let, um, I'm going to hand over to Philip actually, who is um, uh, the um, CCCM Head of Programs at Care Aid Support Initiative in Nigeria. Um, he's based in Borno State, if I'm not wrong. And um, um, he is also a member of our Rotational Advisory Board in the Community Engagement Forum. Uh, so he's, uh, we've been working a lot together on community engagement in displacement, both globally and in Nigeria. Um, and this request for this topic actually came from um, our colleagues in northern Nigeria originally a while back. Um, uh, and Philip, I'm going to hand over to you to maybe explain the situation in northern Nigeria um, and closure a little bit more. And then if you could um, talk about how you've engaged the community um, and the challenges that you have there, that would be great. So over to you. OK, um, thank you very much, Kristen. Uh, yes, and uh, hi, everyone. So uh, basically, uh, in Nigeria down here, we've experienced uh, camp closures and uh, quite a number of camps were being closed. Uh, but before I proceed, I think uh, I would like to take us back a little on uh, uh, what camp closures are really all about is, uh, and then uh, when does a camp close, basically, to, to link it with uh, the Nigerian context. As we all know that camp, uh, camp closures are basically concept, uh, context specific. So for us in Nigeria here, uh, durable solution is the driving force for actually uh, closing camps here by the government. And uh, I really mentioned uh, the two experiences we had here where uh, the camp closures in coordination with the cluster, this, uh, the CCCM sector, which uh, really went well. And then the other one is uh, without the CCCM cluster as well as without community engagement. So the role of my own um, uh, experience here will be based on the camp closure or durable solution with community engagement in consolidation with the community. So basically, the, for Nigeria, we have uh, we had a couple of camps that we have been closed, and uh, uh, there was several return intention surveys that were carried out, and uh, quite a number of consultations with the community. I could remember in some camps where I managed, while well, I uh, stadium come here there has been returned intentions of it by IOM, UNHCR and other colleagues as well as the government uh, and then these communities were actually relocated back the camps were the, the camps was basically closed and then they've been relocated back to their place of origin uh, which is uh, somewhere in the northern part of Nigeria uh, the, the good practice here is uh, there was a community engagement the process uh, actually engage the community in uh, ensuring that they are being asked, consulted about you feeling safe, we taking you back to your place of origin, or we taking you back to other locations. And then uh, 
they, they ask so many questions and there, there are so many, uh, you know, uh, comments from them regarding durable solution. Do we have facilities like health? Do we have, okay, why are you really taking us or why is this camp, uh, camp uh, closing? You know, so many questions. But however, through those return intention surveys and then we were able to get the mind of the people, we were able to get the situation and then communicate accordingly, of which it happened. And then at the end of the day, as I'm talking to you, the camp has been closed and then those people are now basing in their place of origin. How? Because they were consulted. Now, the other experience here down in Nigeria is that um, communities were not consulted. And then uh, what really happened was uh, they were, you know, the camp was, or the camp was closed uh, due to probably lack of assistance and then due to government want to make use of the facility due to so many reasons, you know. And then uh, those communities were actually relocated back to the village. And then uh, what we began experiencing in some other camps is those people coming back themselves, you know, into the city as well. Because what? They were not consulted and then they don't feel safe in all those locations that we, they were being relocated to. So the, the, the camp closure here in Nigeria basically uh, is, is quite a two-phase because uh, uh, the, the process requires analysis, requires consultation, it requires coordination, it requires a lot of planning. And then uh, both at the national and then at the settlement, at the site level. So uh, there, there, there could never be like a good scam closure or good relocation without, you know, community engagement. Roles and responsibilities really of all actors, including the project participants and everyone really need to be effective. So for other uh, experiences we had, yes, it was really nice, but for others, no. It's led to having, you know, some pocket of IDPs uh, all around spread within the city, you know, from uh, uh, formal camps to uh, to other uh, to other places. Uh, hello, can can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you fine. Let's work. Can you hear us? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm back. So, uh, now you're frozen. The right turn. Hello, Philip. Hello, Philip. I Sorry, think he everyone. Has issue. He has yeah. 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 Thank I think you. this is standard practice when we have um, people calling in from different places. Uh, so I think this is to be expected. Um. um I think. In the meantime, while we wait for Philip um, to come back, feel free to, if you have any questions um, for our, for Philip or um, any of our, any of our other colleagues who'll contribute, um, you can write it in the chat or um, you can just raise your hand as well and ask the question. Um, uh, Jan. Thank you, uh, edible format uh, for uh, end of uh, end of uh, the operations uh, that could be some efficient because it's uh, edible, so it can be used anywhere with uh, taking in and taking out things. So I had to put it on email because I couldn't. Okay, let me open my email and I'll see if I can share it here. Mm -mm. Um, okay, um, Fernanda, has, she has a question for Philip on what methods of community engagement was used. Um, let's save them for him for when he comes back. And uh, uh, in the meantime, maybe we can use this time. I'll introduce you to Kate, who you can see here on the screen. Uh, Kate Holland, she's a CCCM specialist consultant. Um, she's worked 
for the last 10 years in a context including Iraq, Cox Bazar in Bangladesh, in South Sudan, in Ukraine and Jordan, uh, both as a CCM practitioner and coordinator, um, sorry, cluster coordinator. Um, today, she'll bring her experiences on site closure, especially from Iraq. Um, um, from 2016, and I actually don't remember um, what we were talking about. The, there were two two stages of uh, closure that we were chatting about when we had our pre-chat, Kate. Um, I'm going to hand over to you, and um, you can tell us the, the actual correct information. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. Um, there's also, an, as we said at the beginning of the call, um, a couple of other colleagues from Iraq who've been through a lot of the ways of camp closures, Zuhair and Abdul Qadr. Um, so any questions, I will probably defer to them um, or at least bring them in. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, Philip was mentioning that there is no good camp closure without community engagement. Um, I'm going to talk about camp closures in Iraq that were not good. Um, so the Iraq, uh, sort of the major displacement in Iraq happened from 2014 through 2016. There were many people who returned from the camps um, by themselves um, and camp consolidations um, and closures that have planned camp consolidation and closures that happened as part of that. What I'm going to talk about is uh, unplanned closures, so sudden closures, forced evictions um, from the camps, um, in which sort of took place from 2017 through 2022, and actually really still um, up to the present day with the remaining IDP camps um, are still, I believe, under significant um, pressure toward closure. Um, so what that looked like was initially um, pressure at governorate level, so local authorities um, pushing toward the camp closure. There was a strong narrative um, among the, the government, firstly at, at local governorate state level, um, to say the crisis is over, people should return home, there's no need to still be in these camps, whereas in reality many of the people were not able to return either because of personal security problems or because their, their homes, their communities, infrastructure was destroyed. So a lot of pressure um, towards camp closures and for people to return, which then um, resulted in forced forced closures and in waves, some of which was initially done at um, a local level, um, but then also was pushed by the national authorities as well. Um, that included um, threats towards the community to leave, to make people leave the camps, formal announcements of closures, use of um, armed police as well to, to get people to move. Um, and I think the, the shortest notice period of camp closure, um, when I was there at least, was 48 hours for the closure announcement for then people to vacate the camp. So in this situation, how do we communicate with the community with this really, um, yeah, with this really difficult situation? So um, I was there in Iraq first working um, with DRC, um, the CCM team, and then with the cluster. So I was going to talk a little bit about those two experiences. And again, um, my colleagues uh, from Iraq who are also here, a much better place than I am to talk about the realities of that. So a real challenge for the CCCM teams um, in this context of a lot of government pressure and camp closure. On the one hand, a lot of advocacy is going on through humanitarian actors at very high level toward the government to stop the closure. Families in the camps are, of course, aware of what's going on. Um, so trying to balance um, trying to balance the situation of where you know that a camp closure may happen, you don't want to announce it to the family. Um, so at camp level, um, I think the the main, um, at least on the, the DRC side, the main um, way um, that the teams were trying to engage with the community is to be as truthful as possible, as open as possible. It had a very strong line that um, the humanitarian camp management teams were not going to be um, we're not going to be the ones communicating the camp closure. So a lot of advocacy toward the authorities to say, if you're going to be the one, if you are going to close the camp, you need to make the formal announcement. Um, in terms of the community engagement strategy, very dynamic one. Um, so having key messages that the CCM teams would be briefed by the camp managers um, on, in many cases, every morning, um, updating on what's happening, getting feedback from the staff, from the community mobilizers who were, you know, living in the camp among the community, using the existing 
community committees, block leaders, etc., um, to to share these messages. Um, trying to frame a lot in terms of a dynamic um, conversation, and as I, I said again, um, trying to balance being truthful um, about the situation, what was happening, with not spreading rumor and creating panic in the camp, which did mean there were difficult decisions at some points to say we, as the camp management agency, know that this camp closure is being threatened. When do we, when do we tell the community we have more information um, than than they do? So yeah, some difficult decisions um, there as well. In a, one of the ways trying to reconcile this was pushing again, pushing the local authorities to be in the camp to be present, encouraging community leaders to be the ones going to the authorities and asking for clarifications and asking for formal government letters as well, announcing the camp closure. Um, and had a strong position that once that formal letter came, camp management would make copies, would share the information, um, but that the official announcement had to come from, from the authorities. One of the other things um, doing it was very informal rumour tracking and doing that not through um, sort of techno technology, um, but through the much more traditional community mobilisation teams, sort of coming together in an afternoon, in a morning, saying this is what we're hearing people saying in the camp, and then working with the team to revise revise sort of key messages um, as part of that. Some of that was having very kind of quickly written out messages so that the teams knew exactly the information that they'd be sharing, having information desk staff, having questions that we anticipated that people might ask and answers to that, and really encouraging them to say, I don't know as well, if they didn't know the answer to the information. Um, I think one of the other really interesting things that some of the DRC CCCM teams with protection were trying to do as well um, was encouraging family contingency planning. Um, so as well as the protection teams in the situation where people were being pushed to closure, identifying individual families who might um, either struggle to leave, um, have protection issues either sort of once they had left the camp, is to try and work with individual families, sort of putting questions to them saying, if this camp does close, do you know what you're going to do? Do you know where you'll go? And try and not give them information, but encourage them to think of their own contingency plan um, in case in case the camp did close. Um, sort of bringing that up to a bigger picture, um, there was a lot of um, sharing between NGO camp manager, camp management organisations at the time. Um, the camp closures often came in waves. So there's a lot of turning and saying, NRC, you just had a camp that closed last month. What worked for you? What didn't work? What were your key messages? Um, and taking essentially between the different camp management actors, taking what had just happened, refining it um, until that sort of built up into a cluster guidance document um, that then the CCM cluster put together, basically based on this refined set of community engagement um, processes. We did that as a cluster with protection CCCM and had guidance toward camp management actors on basically how to go about um, engaging with the communities um, in this situation, including some suggested key messages and sharing tools that had really been useful um, and that the camp managers have said had been really useful um, for them during the community engagement. Um, that was sort of the end of my my intro, um, I didn't want to speak for too long, so I'm more than happy to take any questions or Kristen, if there's anything else that you want me to focus on more um, or, yeah, please. Um, that's great. That's I love the all these practical tips of what worked for you guys and just um, uh, recognizing the difficulty that the staff who are going to the sites during this process, the difficulty they have and, you know, always balancing how much to share and what to share and the questions that they're getting from the population um having the set of uh, um of key messages i think sounds like a um a safety protocol as much as uh, you know uh, as um key information um philip is back um philip i think you got cut off before yeah. you finished so maybe before we take questions to to Kate and uh, the colleagues from Iraq, I see that um, um, uh, that Namir is here as well. He was working for NRC in Iraq at the time, I think. Um, um, 
So um, I was wondering, Philip, if you would be able to share some of your tips for what worked for you. Um, um, Fernanda is asking what methods of community engagement um, were used um, when you were saying there was some successful community engagement in the closure. Oh, we can't hear you. No? Yes, better. OK, I said there are some tips and some activities that we actually put in place that really helped, uh, you know, uh, perform that uh, a smooth scam closure process in, in some of the camps here. However, there are basically some challenge, but the best practice which really worked out is uh, the communication with the communities, you know, informing the communities and then uh, keeping them informed of the plans and then, uh, you know, the return intention survey, which I mentioned is a very great tool that really helped in terms of getting the community and then being on the same page with the community. So these are majorly what really happened because, of course, they were told, you know, and then part of camp closure is uh, not really something that you have to plan it. Like it has to be seen from the camp setup. You know, yeah, we are not keeping you here forever, but then, yeah, of course, after some while and then after we have found actually uh, probably security as well and then there are assistance or you can move back so yes that has been communicated since the inception of uh, you know the camp so the communities are super aware and then we keep informing them if you know situation gets better and then there are, there are some help decks where people come and then okay yes this is temporary you know camp is not really the, you know the, the forever permanent place for you to stay but however communicating with the communities really worked out and it really helped in terms of having the smooth uh, uh, calm closure in some parts of Nigeria here in some places. However, there are challenges, but uh, I'll really focus on the best practices that really worked. The challenges are some of the calm closures were not really tagged with the cluster, the CCCM cluster in terms of coordination, which is at the national level. However, for, for the settlement level, I think the cluster has uh, really coordinate alongside with its partners, the CCCM partners here, which they were able mm -hmm. to communicate even without having the information, but they ensure that they keep the, the camp population informed and then also prepared for camp closure. So these are some best practices that really worked out. Thank you so much. Um, and I know it's a, yeah, it's a really difficult um, situation. Um, uh, there's a couple of questions there for you, Kate, um, in the chat. Um, one is from Jörn. He's asking if you have any written guidance on the rumours. <laughs> um, I'm looking back through my folder as he asked that question. Um, I don't think so. Um, but what I will do um, is share, more than happy with anyone that's interested, to share the written guidance that the cluster came up with on for camp closures, which primarily focused on community engagement and sort of has within it um, mm -hmm. the best tools that the camp management um, partners shared. I think for the rumor tracking, it was, I'm not even sure we necessarily called it rumor tracking at the time, although probably could have done, um, but it was more of a, a very sort of organic um, way that the camp management team sort of naturally, naturally came up with to share and respond to to information. Um, Jorn, I'll, I'll take a look through and see what I have and we'll share with you yeah, I'll show you what I do have. Um, and uh, we didn't have a community engagement AAP working group um, in Iraq at the time. Maybe that's the reason why we didn't call rumor tracking, rumor tracking necessarily. Um, so most of this was done through the through the CCCM cluster um, with engagement and protection colleagues. Um, and yeah, CCCM sort of very much was leading on this, looked to um, as, um, as the leader. I think there had been maybe a CWC working group um, in the past. So we sort of benefited from some of that expertise being carried over and an awful lot of expertise on community engagement um, from the camp management teams as well. Thanks so much. Um, there can be, um, you can continue to post questions in the chat um, or raise your hand if you have any questions at all. Um, but I want to introduce um, our third speaker, who probably needs no introduction at all, uh, Richard Okello. Um, if you have a chance to put on your um, camera for a second, then 
that would be great, Richard. Um, if not, don't worry. Um, because Richard, he's currently there, yes. Uh, nice to see you. Um, so he's currently serving as the CCM cluster coordinator in Mozambique. Um, but over his you know, 25 years of experience, he's worked um, all over Africa, Middle East and Southeast Asia uh, on CCTM, um, always working on community participation and community engagement. Um, he's a, a superstar trainer on all of these topics. Uh, he has a lot of experience in everything under CCM and community engagement. But today he will be talking about um, specifically the experience from Mozambique, where they're implementing an ABC approach, uh, which stands for A, adjustable approaches, B, building bridges, and C, creating cohesive communities. Um, Richard, I'm going to let you talk a little bit more about what that looks like and how it's worked in Mozambique. Thank you, Christine. Uh, uh, sorry, colleagues, I can't use my video because I'm, I'm holding the phone in one hand uh, and my note also in one hand. I want to, to, to show my video. Yeah, um, what we did here in Mo Oh, now you disappeared. Uh, oh, okay, you're uh, back. Can you hear me? Yes, you, you disappeared, but uh, you're back now. Oh, oh, this network shouldn't happen like uh, it happened to my friend Philip. Yeah, but I was saying um, the, con the experience we had here in is not far away from what Kate has just presented about her experience in Iraq and what Philip talked about in, in Nigeria. So what happened in Mozambique when I arrived, I'm very new in Mozambique, I arrived here last year and uh, I uh, started moving into the displacement sites. There are over 100 and so displacement sites in, in Mozambique with the really very minimal uh, infrastructure like the road. The road network is very poor, but also the security environment would hinder access to most of the displacement sites. So relatively, the CCCM response was only in 30 out of the 100 and so displacement sites. So the service provision in most of the sites was really, really very poor, so to say. So we needed, uh, then I came back, uh, started thinking of we need to do our work differently. We need to have a bit of a change. In the way CCCM is engaging with the displaced population. So what we did, um, we worked very closely with the local government the national authority, and also the protection cluster and the shelter cluster. So we made a, a, a map of the displacement sites, and we categorized them into three different categories. There were sites that we, we classified them or categorized them into three categories. There were sites that had the, more or less a very stable community. Uh, there was no much inflows, neither outflows. And the IDPs were so much closer to the, the host community. And again, the typologies in Mozambique is uh, not a classical typology of IDP sites. They, they have what they call the relocation sites, the host community extension, and then resettlement sites. Resettlement site had the bit of better investment, but relocation and then a host community extension, these are sporadic sites, self-settled sites that uh, you know, it had no plan, very poor service provision and being provided. So when we did this, uh, we agreed that we need to you know, categorize them into three different categories. There are those that were really stable and then there are also IDP sites that uh, the relationship between the IDPs and the host community was not very good due to the fact that uh, our targeting, the humanitarian target was targeting only IDPs. You know, you walk through the host community and then go to a very small community for the IDPs and only a third of them. But yet when you look at the, the need level, the needs of the IDPs 
more or less the same as in the host community. And because we were only targeting the IDPs, this created a bit of tension between the IDPs and the host community. Then there were other sites which has uh, active ongoing conflict. It had the component of three population groups. Those that were displaced, the IDPs themselves, that did not move far away from their homes. Colleagues, can I request that? Uh, I'm in a meeting. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm by, by, by the office side here, so I was asking my colleague to move away. So yeah, if you had the, a mix of the three population group, those that were not displaced, the host community, because it'd be almost the same community. Those that are displaced, uh, maybe are displaced about a few kilometers away from the original home, and they cannot go back. And then there are people who are returning to this same area. So it became very deep. There were a lot of sporadic uh, uh, settlements, IDP settlement, and there's so many that you cannot even talk about sites. We decided to group them as areas. And that gave us now opportunity to see the site that had the stable population. We say we need to adjust our approaches here. And that's the, the creation of the A. Adjusting approaches mean we move away from a static response to mobile response to remote response. And remote response requires that we need to enhance the capacity of, first of all, the IDPs themselves, the site management committees, but also linking with the local authority. So that at the, after six months, we actually gave ourselves a timeline. After six months, we gradually pull out of this and leave the management of the site to the local authority and the IDPs mixing with the host community. Um, but also the paradigm shift that we were looking at, because this community a little bit stable. So can we move away from the description of site closure to consolidation of the, of the site, moving the boundaries that divides the IDPs and the host community, but also mixing the committees, the IDP committee and the village development committee to, to form up one committee. Uh, I don't know whether somebody has his microphone uh, well, on. I keep getting that feedback. Um, we can hear you fine. Okay, okay. So, uh, and then we did the capacity building. Key aspects of coordination, some key aspects of managing the complaint and feedback mechanism some key aspects of uh, doing a little bit of monitoring, filling the five W's, and then we gradually pulled out. As we speak, we pulled out of uh, 24. In the area AA, adjusting approaches, where they mapped 49 IDP sites, we pulled out of 20, 24. And the site management is being done by both the IDP, the host community, and the local authority. It's amazing that the local authority are now filling the five W's and sending it to CCCM. But also, we had another engagement with the local authority that how can we win off these people from highly dependent on humanitarian assistance? And in Africa, the beautiful thing, if people have access to farmland, they are able to grow their own food. That in itself is a livelihood. They are able to sell some, uh, you know, some food stuff, get some money, and be able to, you know, buy other things that they may not really have. But the caveat here, uh, colleagues, is that this is very context specific. Uh, it may not be a, you may not be able to pick what we did here in Mozambique and then implement it in Nigeria or in South Sudan. You need to be able to tweak it a little bit, and the. End line is you must understand the context you're working with. You must work very closely with the local authority, enhance their capacity, and let them see the vision that you're really seeing. So the other area that we said BB was building bridges. Because of our response style, we had created a bit of tension between the IDPs and the host community. So can we begin targeting the whole population, the IDPs, based on the vulnerability, based on need, 
if the host community have a similar need. I want to give an example, Christine. In IDP site, we have uh, people maybe living with disability and would need assistive devices, maybe a wheelchair or a white cane or whatever. And also in the host community, we have people with the same need. And we're going with the wheelchairs and only giving the IDPs, leaving the same person here who doesn't have a wheelchair. So we, we agreed that can we target people based on their need? If you're providing a wheelchair for somebody who's living with disability, the IDPs, do the same to the host me a member of the host community that need the same. So these sites, uh, we doing uh, that kind of uh, whole population group targeting and is moving quite well. Of course, funding has been a bit of a challenge, but also the buy-in from other sectors because CCCM alone will not be able to do this. So we had a lot of engagement with other sectors. The, the protection cluster was one of the best clusters to work with and the shelter wash doing some decommissioning and also you know, beginning to target uh, the, the host community. And then the area CC, where we say creating cohesive community. We don't see this community going anywhere. One, it had a mix of those who are returning, early returnees, they have not yet made the final mile to their final destination, but they are in their area of habitual residence already. Then we have those who are never displaced. They, they, they withered the, the displacement, they withered the conflict and stayed back. And then we have uh, those who are displaced yet, just so close to their, their home. So we want to use now the area-based approach for this location, but also the end line is a multi-sectorial response. One sees CCCM doing coordination at the area level, but also shelter or wash or food security responding in their own sectors. So uh, and this may take us uh, between uh, 12 to 24 months. So if all goes well and we have a very good programming by end of 2025, maybe we will have no need for CCCM and we shall have put over 260,000 IDPs on the pathway to solution without talking about site closure, without talking about uh, movement. Because it, the, the current the discussion in the humanitarian work that solution is about movement. People need to return, people need to relocate. But uh, if we can win people off the humanitarian assistance, it's not a solution, but you put them on the pathway to solution. That's our experience for Mozambique. Thank you. Thanks so much, Richard. Um, um, it's really, really interesting um, to hear you talk about this approach. Um, do any of you have any questions for Richard? I can't see any specific questions for Richard in. Oh, yeah, I can actually from Patricia. Um, she is asking. Can you please share some tips on how you shared your presentation or messages to the local authorities regarding community engagement and the feedback mechanism as part of the capacity strengthening? So how did you win over the local authorities, Richard? Thank you, Patricia. Local authority, uh, we had a series of uh, engagement meeting uh, and based at the provincial level. So first of all, to have a discussion, we presented our um, vision to the provincial government and they saw that was really good after that then we had uh, but one of the biggest buy-in with the local authority was the element we we we, we actually did um, adaptation of cccm and disaster risk reduction so and the mozambique is prone to extreme weather events every year and every year from December until April, people are affected by cyclone or floods. So we use that as a litmus paper, beginning to say, yes, why don't we do the mapping? The higher ground, the lower ground, and why don't we do the hydrological analysis of an area so that we identify before disaster strikes, we identify a place for relocation. Let it be a school, let it be a market, let it be a gymnasium, 
that should meet this criteria. So we did this as part of our, our training. We introduced them to the GPS, even site planning itself. We have when identified a place for relocation, you need to do the site planning. Before CCCM came into, into engaging them, they will take months to just do one site plan. So when we introduce them with the software, uh, the AutoCAD and the GPS, they would do just one site mapping plots, about 1,000 plots in one day. And then we provided them with the tools, the GPS, and then the computer. From wherever they are going, they would be talking about CCCM because we enhance their capacity. They are not doing this work themselves. So when we came up with this vision of saying we need to adjust our approaches, we need to see how you can allocate plots, plots of land. And one thing that uh, they did to allocate plots of land to the IDPs to grow their own food. And the, some members of the host community that did not have access to land were also provided that opportunity allocated land. So they bought it in. And then when we now move to the district level, the local level, it was the guys at the provincial level selling the CCCM ideas to the local government at, uh, at the field level. Even when we go to the, the, the village manager, the visit risk reduction committee, it was a provincial government engaging them. So we're just at the background, providing them with some technical information, technical guidelines. So these are the tips maybe you could, could see. There must be a, a buy-in in some way so that they see that you're making a contribution. Thank you so much. Um... That's it's a really good tip. Um, it, there's a question for Emmy. Emmy, do you want to do you want to ask the question? Hey, hey, Chris, and do you mean my question to Kate and Philip? Uh, because, that's what I meant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, because I'm also working in Mozambique. So Richard, I don't have a question for you. <laughs> I ask my questions every day to him. It's great to have Richard in Islamic. It's such a value for all of Very us. Very lucky. Um, so um, thank you to um, also Kate and Philip. It was really interesting uh, to hear from other contexts for us um, as we are in, again in Mozambique in a transition process as well. Um, so I was wondering um, if in Iraq or Nigeria, um, CCCM uh, had a linkage between um, the area of return and the um, place of displacement in the case of um, closing the site, uh, because like, did we make any linkages between the place of return for the solutions in terms of providing assistance and services, long-term housing or livelihood opportunities? And also what was the community engagement part in it? Like, did we do information campaigns about what, um, what they might expect in the place of return. So yeah, overall linkages between the site closures and durable solutions. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Uh, Kate, do you question. want to start? I would love to. Um, so it, in Iraq, um, I think the, the basic answer to your question is yes, somewhat. Um, it sort of differed slightly um, depending on three sort of types of return essentially and also noting that ideally for many families they would not have been pushed toward return at all but staying where they were or relocating is, is quite difficult um, was quite difficult in the Iraq context and wasn't really supported at all by the authorities so return was sort of very much the expectation um, for so talk very quickly about families who themselves left the camps and returned um, there was a facilitated return program as well. And then for families who were forced to leave the camps. Um, the main sort of overarching, I guess, um, principle from the humanitarian side was for humanitarian actors not to be the ones sharing information, um, both from a security perspective. Um, so not saying, you know, this place is clear for minds, this is place is safe and secure for you, wanting people to make their own decisions based on their own information and that not to be um, then, um, yeah, sort of culpability of humanitarian actors. And then on the services side, not to build people's expectations about things they might be entitled to. Um, in in Iraq as well, the people were, in theory, entitled to compensation from the government. Um, so there was information sharing about how they could sign up for that, whether or not they received it was was another matter. Um, what the humanitarian actors did did do initially for the return phase was a big 
a communication campaign which was called Know Before You Go, um, which was community when, when there was a CWC working group. Um, information materials, a lot of community conversations, information desks, really basically saying, do you know these types of information about the areas you're returning to, to try and encourage people to themselves gather information, use their own networks to make informed decisions. Um, I can share, I can share a link to those materials as well. Um, and that, um, I guess, approach was sort of carried through um, through the less voluntary um, return side. Um, there was a facilitated return program at some point. Um, I'll share a link to some guidance that was developed for that. That has a very strong um, aspect on community, well, their community participation in terms of um, planning the program. They did do things like go and see visits, but again, for the humanitarians through the facilitated returns, being the facilitator um, of families going back themselves, finding out information, and then sort of bringing back to the wider community um, to both know whether they wanted to sign up to the return program or um, to help decision make around it. And then for the forced closures, um, what I was mentioning before about this sort of trying to encourage families to contingency plan was sort of based on the know before you go idea to start with, to try and encourage people in a highly stressful environment by that point to get as much information as they could so they could make the best decisions for themselves and their families. What we did try to do was information exchange a lot within between humanitarian and durable solutions actors. Um, so in the bigger waves of return, you know, the areas of origin of people already well known. There was a lot of information collection from um, the camp areas. We had very um, detailed, anonymized data sort of profiles on where people were sort of down to individual district levels um, or individual sort of village levels. Um, and then when people were being forced out of the camps, tying up information um, that we had at camp level or the camp actors had at camp level on areas of origin that were collected through um, camp registration data. Iraq is a very, um, was lucky to have a lot of data available. Sharing that with information actors and um, information, sorry, sharing that with actors in return areas to say, you should be expecting families to come. A lot of advocacy with donors to say, put money into services in these areas. Um, and then one of the other things we did, which might be quite unique to Iraq um, in terms of the resourcing and the networks that we had for that is Iraq had a Call, a big response wide call center that was originally set up as a um, complaints and feedback accountability mechanism. During the big waves of camp closures, we got the what's called the Iraq Information Center on side. Um, as people were leaving the camps, camp management was collecting as they could information on where people were going. Um, and then we were tracking them calling them as well a couple of weeks after to say, where are you and trying to do two things with that sharing data again with service providers to say there are families who are arriving in these areas if you can do proactive outreach and then for any families who needed specific services trying to make direct referrals as well um, but again that was a thing that in Iraq quite lucky to have the, the existing resources and networks to be able to do that um, I hope that answered your question and I will drop the uh, I'll drop the two links in the chat thanks very much um yeah it would be great to to see the, the materials, that'd be amazing. Um, Philip, do you have anything to add from the um, situation in Northern Nigeria? I think it might be a little bit different. Um, I don't know if you have many service providers yes, in the uh, return areas. Yes, uh, for, for Nigeria, I've seen uh, quite a number of engagement with government and then stakeholders as well. So, uh, just to reiterate again, camp closure has to has to be planned for at the earlier stage as well. So I've seen the strategy, the CCCM cluster actually supporting uh, uh, the camp, the camp administrators in terms of uh, strategy and policy making in terms of exit national exit strategies. I've seen where they support in terms of uh, uh, developing camp closure planning coordination and uh, quite a number of uh, data and information management. Uh, coordination at the, the site level as well as the host community, you know, and then uh, communicating with the camp population through the establishment of communication strategies that we have in place, either via sensitization to the host community and as well as the camp itself. So also I've seen part of the best practice here 
for the camp uh, uh, agency, the CCCM agency, is that they are transforming the national exit strategy into action planning as well. So, uh, and then there's this uh, providing defined services, which I've seen uh, CCCM actually are doing even at the camp, uh, you know, the, 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 the relocating end of the IDPs. This has been the best practices. And then the support that the CCCM cluster actually link in time of uh, harmonizing their approaches with the, the government here in Nigeria. So, uh, yes, there is a leakage between the cluster and then the, the government in time of supporting all uh, the camp closure processes uh, with all those uh, information and then uh, the coordination processes as well as the exit strategy plan. Yeah, over. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, and speaking of materials, Richard, I'm wondering, would you have any guidance on the ABC approach that you would be able to share as well with us? Um, any guidelines uh, yes. or things? We have uh, some write-up, uh, the strategy itself that uh, need to tweak to, to meet the discussion and also to make it simpler to be understood. Uh, I can be able to share. That would be amazing. Thank you. Um, are there any questions that we haven't addressed from the chat yet? Or do you have any other questions that you'd like to ask now? Um, so both Richard and uh, Yaksan as well in the chat, you're mentioning you know, the um, issues around reduced funding um, in the attempts to, to address both host community and displaced um, in a, in um, your targeting. So I'm wondering if if this is to be shared with donors, if we have any donors in the chat right now, what would you tell them? Any of you, Richard, Kate, um, um, Philip? Any <laughs> yes. That, that's quite a, a good a good question, uh, Christine. But uh, in Mozambique, I was lucky to have uh, this strategy presented to the HCT, HCT Plus, that included the, the donors as well. And there was a deliberate move to include uh, this approach into the HNRP for 2024. And this also currently we're also having a discussion to have it included in the uh, humanitarian response plan for 2025. In a way, since the humanitarian response plan is an advocacy tool, and many donors have access to it, uh, we could say, no, CCCM is not about sites. It's about the people. And CCCM is able to place people on the, the pathway to solution. If we receive more money, I think we would be able to place many IDPs on the pathway to solutions than focusing on sites, as, as they, they think our name is. That's what I would tell them. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Kate, Philip, any messages uh, for donors? Um, flexible funding, which I think was was actually in the Iraq experience quite often available, um, at least to the, the NGO partners. But um, particularly when you're dealing dealing with things that are unexpected or dealing with planned planned camp closures, um, the ability to to move money around um, between activities and move money around between response areas was hugely beneficial um, in being able to be, yeah, able to appropriately respond. Excellent for funding, always. Absolutely, and community engagement is so important. Uh, Philip, do you have any messages for, for donors? Um, let's see, I lost the chat. What is Yaxon saying? Um, you want to speak up, Yaxan? Oh, thank you. I was not. Uh, I did not want to speak up. But probably if we <laughs> have more funding, but it's fine. Uh, if we do more coordination with other clusters, because some people think CCCM is only about the, as Philip mentioned, it's not only about the camp itself. It's not the site because our sites always within the community, and different communities. So coordination with other communities, it's essential. It's very important as much as a response. And sometimes because of the, the emergencies, we really have no time to do all the right coordinations. But coordination is so important with the community. Thank you, Kristen. 
Thanks so much and sorry for putting you on the spot there. I have no problem. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear you talk anyway. Um, then if there are no more questions, um, it's, um, it's been an hour already and I'm conscious that people will have other commitments. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to Philip and Kate and Richard. Um, Abdi, did you raise your hand on purpose? So a hand from Abdi. It was my mistake, sorry. No problem. I do that all the time. Uh, Fernanda, did you raise your hand? No, no, it was by mistake as well. I was just clapping. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, it, it helps being more interactive, though, when people are making mistakes like this, I get them to speak up. There's a lot of uh, applause for you here, everyone. So um, thanks very much. Um, uh, and as you know, we've recorded this session, so we will share the recording with the, a summary of the key points very soon. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Kristen. Bye. Thank you. Jan. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank Kate, you. Was nice. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Richard. Bye. Bye. Bye.